Hey guys, what is up? It's me, EDJ here, and today we're going to be reacting to another episode video from Oversimplified, this time on the Prohibition era, and I kind of like to give a little bit of what I know. The Prohibition, I think some of the most, I think ultimately everyone knows it didn't work, <laughs> despite it sounding like such a noble idea of getting rid of the vice of alcohol, it, um... It didn't work overall. We all know that, and and something else that um yeah it took place in the I think it ended or took place during the twenties. I know that Al Capone was really prominent during this era. I think that's another thing a lot of people know about. Didn't work, and Al Capone and the gangsters, the bootlegging, you know, a lot of the speakeasies and the crime. It's a really interesting time actually in US history and I feel like that's kind of the synopsis of what I know the more inner details oversimplified about to explain and before I get started right into watching this video I want to give credit where it is due please follow subscribe support to oversimplified I think the man deserves it and yeah that's about it without any further ado let's just get right into it let's watch oversimplified the prohibition awesome let's do this dudes possible buy honey click the link below to save money on your online shopping and also limited edition al capone <laughs> on sale now get them quick before they sell out link in the description down below Good morning, honey. What's for breakfast? The usual. Two caskets of rum, a mug of hard cider, and a full bottle of wine. Oh, dang. Oh, boy. Oh, I'm running late. I'll have to take it with me. Don't forget your lunch. It's a six-pack of beer, a flask of whiskey, <laughs> six shots of tequila, and as a special treat, a banana. Ah, oh, gee whiz. I'm gonna be smashed gonna today. Die today. Enjoy your Alcohol day operating poisoning, sharp, right? dangerous farm equipment. I can't believe this is an acceptable way to live. God bless America. Okay, gotta go. <laughs> I love my life. I always love um some of oversimplified's like little caricatures have like super realistic faces while others don't. I don't know why I always like that. <laughs> America, the land of beautiful strip malls, top I, I was say strip clubs, and wonderful <laughs> urban sprawl. Ah yes, beautiful America. But what's the most American thing you can think of? The Statue of Liberty? Mount Rushmore? A crazy lady in a mobility yeah, scooter yelling at a pigeon? Well, what if I told you the answer is alcohol? Oh. Oh, yeah. That's right. When the Puritans arrived on America's shores, they brought a ship packed with beer. George Washington provided his men with a daily cup of whiskey. Mm -hmm. Andrew Jackson's inauguration party left the White House so trashed that everybody had to be ordered outside. <laughs> Frederick Douglass said whiskey made him feel like a president. Me too, Frederick. <laughs> Me too. Americans drink a breakfast. Doctors prescribe their patients hard liquor. Dang. In the 19th century, Americans drink three times as much as their modern day counterparts. Wow. That's a lot of whiskey. That's hey, trippy, Jerry, dude. How's that report coming along? Already done, sir. I've also organized your paperwork, watered your flowers, and been a father figure to your children. Wait a minute. What's that smell? Have you been drinking at work? No, sir. I would never. Well, why yeah, not? Everyone's doing it. Everyone else <laughs> yeah. is doing it. But I got all my work done. You're fired. <laughs> Americans drink at work. They drink at barn raisings, baptisms, and public hangings. Oh, Heavy wow. drinking was so normal that it was as American as apple pie. <sighs> Hi, everyone. My name's Ron, and I'm an alcoholic. Get over yourself, Ron. We're all alcoholics. Mm. But more and more <laughs> Americans began to wonder whether all of this truly was a normal way to live. Were Americans drinking, perhaps, a little too Maybe much? A tad bit. Well, one group in particular thought the answer to that was yes. You know them, you love them. Woman. Oh crap, woman! <laughs> Run! <laughs> Hang on, we just want to talk. Woman talking in public? That's outrageous. Woman talking in public? That's You've got outrageous. two kids and a wife at home, yet here you are spending your entire paycheck on booze. Mm -hmm. And you, Dr. Spanky, you were on the cusp of discovering time travel. But what did you discover instead? The sweet, sweet joys <laughs> of whiskey. That's right. Alcohol. It's destroying our families, our jobs, and our homes. She's right. She's right. You know. Hang on, men. Don't let them get to you. This saloon is our safe space where our wives and children can't annoy us with reality, <laughs> where we're free to be real men. She's right. She's right. I am a man. And what does it real men do? Take care of their families. Nah. Nah, that's lame. <laughs> no. We drink beer, we shoot guns, and we mud wrestle. Heck yeah, dude. 
That's As what America's men do. <laughs> ruined more and more lives, moral resistance began to arise, and women were at the forefront, taking matters into their own hands at a time when women doing just about anything was shocking. They'd had enough of being victim to their husband's heavy drinking, and they were going to do something unprecedented. You're going to what? I'm going to protest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sweetie. Women can protest. Women can protest. <laughs> Whoa. Shocking. Starting in Ohio, before spreading nationwide, women began a crusade against alcohol. They marched through towns and cities, singing hymns, gathering outside saloons, and praying on their knees. Women praying was so terrifying that in some towns, schools were shut and business stagnated. No way. On one occasion, firemen were called out to hose down the dangerous praying women. On wow. another, the owner of a beer garden reportedly holed a cannon outside and threatened to reduce the savage woman to <laughs> dust. Nevertheless, they persisted. They prayed even they harder. WCTU in 1874. That is wild. Wait. They set up homes I'm for sorry, that is one. wild. Shutting down schools and threatening to blow people up and hosing them just just for marching and praying. That is wild. That's wow. Women. They installed water fountains in public parks. They wrote textbooks for school children that contained some interesting claims about drinking alcohol. Here's little Timmy. Uh oh. Looks like Timmy's gonna have his first drink. He's taking a small sip of whiskey, and Timmy has spontaneously combusted. Scare them straight. Women's efforts <laughs> weren't in vain. In small towns across America, drugstores agreed to stop fulfilling prescriptions for alcohol. Men committed themselves to giving up drink. Inspired by the women's moral fervor, some saloon owners closed their doors. Mm -hmm. The women's crusade and other temperance movements were forcing people to reconsider alcohol's role in society, and more people began to side with the growing temperance movement. Many states had even begun enacting their own dry laws that restricted the sale and use of yeah, alcohol. Yeah, I remember this. I remember that this movement was incredibly, like, effective, actually. Um, this wem women's temperance movement, and they definitely for the most part, like, on paper, achieved what they wanted. But we'll talk more about it later, when we get to it. One of them was Kansas, where alcohol had been outlawed since 1881. Despite this, many illegal saloons remained open, and authorities had done just about nothing to stop them. <laughs> One woman, disgusted by what she saw, decided she would take the law into her own hands. And not just any woman, a terrifying, hatchet-wielding, sweet old lady named Carrie Nation. Armed with her trusty hatchet and a bag of what she called smashers, she traveled from town to town visiting saloons. But she wasn't there to get smashed. She was there to smash. <laughs> the men could do nothing but cower as sweet little Carrie hulked out and tore the place to shreds. She went to Kiowa and smashy smash. Wow. Wichita, smashy smash. Topeka, smashy so smash. So like vandalism? Is, is that vandalism? <laughs> but each time they were like, okay, Carrie, we're going to let you go so long as you promise to be a good girl and not smash up any more saloons. Okay? Screw you, pig! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think she's gonna be all right. Smash, smash, <laughs> smash. Carrie's tactics shocked the other members of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, but she assured them, and this is a quote, ladies, you do not know how much joy you will have until you smash, smash, smash. <laughs> Carrie became a household name, and she hoped her unusual tactics would spread across the country. But unfortunately, many of the women's movements eventually slowed down. Why? Well, because of oh, this wait kind a of minute. thing. Thelma! I ripped my pants again. Ugh. Well, you'll have to sew them yourself because I'm going out protesting. What? I don't know how to sew. What if I burn the house down and get eaten by alligators? What? How? Don't be <laughs> stupid, Mitch. Look, I've got to go. Call me stupid? She's the one who's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Thelma! Look who's stupid now! We know you're hovering over that. Yeah, button, that's exactly what happens. That's why we, we need have a women. Button, we promise. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I, I'm afraid of things like this gonna get me cancelled. <laughs> but yeah, I think back then, yeah, women were expected to have the the responsi the household responsibilities, right? It's different now, but yeah. Though I wouldn't mind being a stay at home husband. Dude, I'd I'd jump on that. Like, if, if there's a woman who wants to work and it's like, you stay home, I'm like, whatever you say, boom, I'll have dinner ready by nine. <laughs> See, while the women were out protesting, there was nobody to do the cooking and cleaning and being seen and not heard, and they gradually had to return to their duties at home. But where the woman had got the ball rolling, a new movement was about to take that ball all the way to Washington, D.C. 
I'm talking about the Anti-Saloon League. Mm. The Anti-Saloon League was a political pressure group run by a very sweet looking old man. But don't let that- He looks like Ned Flanders. <laughs> This guy was an evil genius. While the women's movements were interested in a whole range of issues, Wayne Wheeler and the Anti-Saloon League only cared about enemy number one, Mr. Al Cahol. And as a result, they were extremely effective. They were able to exploit the fears of the American people. And I mean everyone's fears. Here's how they did it. Hello, sir. Welcome to the Liberal Progressive Rally. Why don't you introduce yourself? Well, I'm Patty, and I'm an immigrant from Ireland. And tell me, Patty, do you drink? Oh, yes. I drink a lot. See, folks? People like Patty come here looking for a better life, only to end up drunk in the gutter. Don't worry, sir. We're gonna help you. <laughs> hey, man, you're doing great. I just need you for one more thing. Hey, Christian conservatives. Oh, my goodness. This is Patty. He's a dirty Catholic Irish immigrant who's come to destroy America with his alcohol fueled debauchery! <laughs> Workers were told okay. alcohol was a cat. Yeah, so. Oh my god, he said his name and I forgot. I'm so sorry, everyone. Wheeler, I think that's his name. I was about to say Ned Flanders. I was about to go the rest of this video calling him Ned Flanders. But, um. Yeah, obviously, really devious, yet effective strategy, <laughs> you know? And I think I was wrong about the. the woman's temperance movement earlier. I mean. By proxy, they kind of got what they wanted, like, at least in ret in terms of alcohol. Um, but the incompetence of husbands being alone without their wives, just, they have to go back and save their household, right? <laughs> Capitalist ploy to keep them subjugated. Factory owners were told alcohol was making their irresponsible workers lazy. The black community was warned alcohol was hindering its progress, while racists were warned alcohol would turn black men into brutes. In one of the most wow. confusing eras of American politics, Just totally selling it to everyone, huh? found themselves agreeing on at least one thing. Alcohol was bad. The Anti-Saloon League also made great use of propaganda, something prohibitionists have been doing for decades. Take this specimen, for example, that warns what will happen to you if you start drinking. Let's see. First, you take a drink. You get a little rowdy. Okay. You make some new friends. Nice. Then you become homeless. You turn to crime. And... Uh, oh, boy. Uh, oh. oh. But the most effective tactic Wheeler used to force prohibition on America was pressure politics. In any election he could, Wheeler very successfully rounded up support against any politician who was in favor of alcohol. In Ohio alone, he had 70 state representatives and the popular Republican governor ousted from office and replaced with prohibitionists. Wow. Suddenly, every politician in America was afraid of Wayne Wheeler. Even those who enjoyed alcohol in private began pretending to be against it in public. Alcohol is delicious. Uh, I mean, malicious. Sorry, Wayne. I'm really drunk right now. <laughs> then it really hit the fan in 1917, when America found itself fighting in the First World War against Germany. Anti-German sentiment exploded. Sauerkraut became Liberty Cabbage. German measles became Liberty mm. Measles. And Dachshunds became the embodiment of evil. Uh. See, America? You've always been this way. The biggest Poor brewers in America goes. were German, and Wheeler saw to it that drinking alcohol became akin to pro-German treason. The German brewers desperately tried to fight back, creating their own propaganda, presenting beer as a healthy beverage, one that you could even give <laughs> to your kids. As you can imagine, it didn't go down well. <laughs> that is... <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry, just... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> give your one month old baby some alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> oh man you know there's always someone out there who will do something dumb just the thought of there may have been someone who may have saw this ad and been like yeah I'll, I'll give my baby some like alcohol and did it it's just i'm sorry the thought just made me laugh forgive me everyone president wilson instituted some temporary wartime prohibition measures to save grain for food and with many in the country now in support of prohibition all that was left was to make it law one problem was that taxes on alcohol made up nearly 40 percent of the u.s government's annual yeah. revenue and the government wasn't just about to give that up no problem the anti-saloon league helped lobby for the creation of a new income tax on the american people and just like that the government was no longer reliant on alcohol prohibition was finally introduced to congress in 1913. i have to give it to wheeler the man the man definitely was effective in getting the nation getting prohibition started but i think he lacked when actually keeping it and enforcing it during um 
after it won. Like, he, he got to, to the point, but from then on, he couldn't maintain it, you know? Not just as a law, but a constitutional amendment. Oh, the 18th in amendment, that's right. As the House held their final vote on the Prohibition Amendment, Wheeler was watching from the gallery. You spineless cowards. I know half of you drink, yet here you are bowing down to Ned Flanders. <laughs> look at him, like he's some he kind of Caesar. does look like Ned Flanders. Well, don't be so dramatic. I obviously don't think I'm Caesar. Now release the lion. <laughs> In the end, Prohibition passed the House easily. 282 votes to 128, mm. and the states ratified the new amendment by 1919. America, a nation obsessed with liberty and freedom, had just voluntarily given up its private right to choose whether or not to drink alcohol. We did it, folks. We fixed everything. America will be perfect forever. But you just dissolved America's fifth largest industry and lost tens of thousands of jobs for us immigrants. No, you idiot. You don't get it. We helped you, idiot. <laughs> Ugh, I could really go for a beer. <laughs> no. Immediately after prohibition yeah, there, went into there effect, begins. alcohol consumption in America decreased as Americans followed the law and tried not drinking. Man, if we're going to be law-abiding good boys, we need something else to fill the dark, lonely void that delicious beer once did. Well, how about we crack open a nice cold can of water? <laughs> Hell yeah! <laughs> Toss it over! It just doesn't hit the same. Nah, this isn't doing it for me. Let's try knitting. This isn't filling the dark void at all. Wanna play some kites? Ah, screw it. Let's go get some illegal beer. <laughs> well, it seemed like many Americans supported prohibition. After the law went into effect, it seemed like just as many Americans intended to keep on drinking. And they would go on to find a variety of ways to break the new law. Here's a question for you. Do you like breaking the law? Well, shame no. on you. <laughs> or do you like saving money when you shop online? Oh, boy. Then you should use. Pretty soon after the new law went into effect, the failures of prohibition were already beginning to rear their ugly. You know, I wanted to kind of mention that I personally don't drink alcohol. I've never drank alcohol. Um, I, not to make myself sound like I'm righteous. It's just like where from where I'm at, guys. Where I'm from, everyone like drinks. In fact, a lot of people I was growing up with was like one of the big things is well, you turn twenty one, yeah, I get to get drunk. You know, like people were really looking forward to that. Um, I personally have seen the effects of alcohol and how it could, like, I, I've seen the uglier side, you know, like, people I knew, um, really fall bad as I was a child growing up, how alcohol made them, you know, do really dumb, bad things, and then the hangovers they'd have over looking miserable and awful. And it's just like, I was from a child, from childhood, I was like, no alcohol, never, not once. And I've kept that now that I'm 23 years old, I, I can say that I've kept that. Same goes with drugs. I've never done drugs, never will do drugs. And, you know, it's funny because like, I, I have the stance, right? I don't do drugs, no alcohol, never have, never will. And so like prohibition is something that I, you know, you think I would instantly take a, a stance like yeah yeah definitely but oddly enough no like I, I don't think i don't find it effective like obviously as history has proven it's not but it's like just saying no we banned this just makes the problem even worse i it seems sometimes like with the drug issue or um you know like at the end alcohol is so ingrained in just the world, not just American society, I feel like it's it's heavy in the world, and it's like just saying, okay, you can't do that anymore. Yeah, it's gonna like like he just mentioned like the fifth leading industry, like that's you can't just get rid of it now. It's it's just too much in our world, and you know like you could obviously just have like a moral thing, like don't do it, but at the same time, is getting rid of the will, the free will of people choosing to do alcohol or not good? As history has proven, no, <laughs> it didn't work. And yeah, I think even I'm like, I wouldn't have been for it, even though I personally don't drink or smoke or whatnot. Even though I do think alcohol is bad, I think vices like, you know, alcohol and drugs are bad at the end. People will do them and... I don't know, I don't know if we should just get rid of that, you know? Probably not, I would I would have been against it. I don't know, that's just kinda like my my 
thoughts, my little rambles uh, regarding the issue. Heads. For starters, the details of the new prohibition law, written by none other than Wayne Wheeler himself, turned out to be more draconian than expected. Mm. Many prohibition supporters only wanted to outlaw hard liquor and hoped beer would remain legal. But the Volstead Act outlawed anything over 0.5%. That would make liberty cabbage illegal. Oh, Secondly, wow. the new law was full of loopholes that Americans very quickly began to exploit. For example, while the sale and manufacture of liquor was illegal, drinking it wasn't. And you could also keep oh, wow. any alcohol you had before the law went into effect. So many private clubs hoarded huge amounts of alcohol that saw them through the entire prohibition period. Whiskey intended for medicinal purposes was also allowed, and doctors basically became bartenders. Dang, it was so that a is wild. epidemic had broken out as there was a sudden surge in prescriptions for whiskey. <laughs> Everyone's getting wine sick used by now. churches and synagogues <laughs> were also permitted. Orders for communion wine suspiciously skyrocketed by millions of gallons. And as rabbis had access to religious wine, suddenly everyone was becoming a rabbi. You had Rabbi Pat O'Leary, Rabbi LL Cool J, <laughs> Rabbi Fluffy. But don't worry, uh, I'm sure all these definitely legitimate religious figures couldn't possibly be selling wine in the back alley after mass. Yep, definitely nothing strange going on here. New so products devious. also hit the shelves in the stores, <laughs> such as Vine Glow, a brick of dehydrated grape juice, itself not alcoholic and therefore perfectly legal. But the packaging did contain a strangely specific warning. After dissolving the brick in a gallon of water, do not place the liquid in a jug in the cupboard for 20 days, because then it would turn into wine. I'll take a thousand. Yes, sir. Now, at this point, I want you to think back for me, if you will, to the year 2005. You're the coolest kid around, and you convince your parents to rent the greatest movie of all time. He drink go to the The movie starts with a strange message. Something about not downloading a car? You immediately disregard that and hop on Kazaa to download the greatest song of all time. And in the process, drain your dad's bank account with copious amounts of ransomware. You were breaking the law, you bad boy or girl. But did anyone come to arrest you? No. No. That's there it point. is, yeah. If no one's enforcing a law while everyone's breaking it, is it really a law? And so it was with prohibition. See, the conservative-led governments of the decade were also the kind of people who believed in small government spending. So they'd passed a law that would be extremely difficult to enforce, but also didn't want to spend any of the money required to enforce it. The newly created Bureau of Prohibition wow. only had 1,500 <laughs> agents to cover the entire country. That's one agent for every 70,666 Americans <laughs> in a massive country with 12,000 miles of coastline and one gigantic land border with Canada. I Good. think even if they did like heavily enforce it, it still wouldn't have succeeded personally. That's just, uh, this is my op opinion or thought. Luck schmuckos. And all these clever little loopholes people were using to score illegal booze were only just the beginning. America was about to devolve into alcohol-fueled criminal chaos. Dang it. By outlawing it, prohibition had made alcohol a precious commodity. And millions of Americans would become outlaws as they found a variety of ways to score illegal booze. For example, many Americans began making their own liquor. Illegal stills from making moonshine were found by prohibition agents from the hills of Kentucky and the caves of Arizona to parking lots in major cities and even in the homes of prohibition supporting politicians. Oh, come on now, fellas. I voted for prohibition. I'm not going to have an illegal still. What's this? That's my son, Freddy. S say hi, Freddy. Sir, this is obviously an illegal still. How dare you? Hey, what's this in the bathtub? That's bath water. Why does it taste like alcohol? Oh my gosh. Uh, here's a better question. Why are you tasting my bath water, weirdo? Okay, I just want to rant. The bath water thing is disgusting. We're getting more depraved as a society, aren't we? Like, I'm noticing all these weird, like, creepy perversions, especially with the rise of, like, Twitch and e-girls e and stuff. It's, like, genuinely disturbing. Like, why would anyone pay so much for bath water? It's just so dumb, dude. It's like, ew, what are you gonna do with it? Like, I don't even want to imagine what people have done trying to buy it. Like, who's that woman? You know, you know that, that one famous... I think she was on Twitch? I don't know. Woman who was selling her bath water. I'm like... Ew, I don't know. I I'm sorry, I just need to round. It's just something that disgusts me, personally. Like, I find it d weird. Come on, Freddy. Let's get away from these perverts. To discourage moonshining, the government began adding extra toxins to many of the products moonshiners were using, which resulted in many cases of severe illness and death. But alcohol wow. wasn't just being made at home. Along America's vast coastlines, rum runners smuggled alcohol into the country by sea. 
A floating supermarket known as Rum Row extended along the East Coast just beyond America's maritime limit, and bootleggers frequently sailed out in small boats to pick up shipments of booze. These bootleggers could then be found selling their illegal products everywhere, even in the holes of Congress. Wow, mm. Pop. One day, Corrupt. I want to work here. <laughs> well, son, if you work hard and never give up, one day even you could be a massive hypocrite. <laughs> even President Harding was known to serve his cabinet bootlegged whiskey, and oh, some President were Harding. so successful, they became bazillionaires, such as Roy Olmsted, an ex-cop who became one of the biggest employers in the Seattle area from smuggling booze. Unfortunately, all of his whiskey came from Canada. Yuck. All of this criminality <laughs> was being made possible by copious oh, amounts of corruption. Across the country, armies of government officials were persuaded to turn a blind eye. Bootleggers became so rich, it was no problem to stuff a couple thousand dollars into the front pocket of the police chief, or the mayor, or their disapproving mother. And some cops were getting almost as rich as the bootleggers. All right, men, everyone uh -oh. gather in. I've received word that one of you has been taking bribes. Yeah, just the rampant rise of corruption and hypocrisy from all this is insane. Like, wow. From bootleggers. Any ideas who? Kevin. <laughs> Got any thoughts? No, sir. Many police officers came from the same communities that drank a lot, and they weren't about to arrest their own granddads for knocking back some homemade gin. But all this isn't to say there was no enforcement. Plenty of government officials were doing their best to enforce the new laws, and some unlucky individuals received very harsh penalties, such as a Michigan mother who was sentenced to life in prison for small-scale moonshining. Cases oh, wow. like these were widely reported in the media and only served to make prohibition even more unpopular. But not just that, the media also left to cover the exploits of the most famous bootleggers, turning them into national icons. Okay, I think he's gonna get to it. Al Capone, yeah, Al Capone, arguably the most famous gangster, I think, ever. Like, if you, you held a gun to my head right now and be like, name a gangster, I'll be like, Al Capone. And he's like, okay, name another one, I don't know, <laughs> like, you know. Um, yeah, and I think what's so interesting about him is that he was kind of like a celebrity in a way like he was like a public very public very flamboyant playing it up for the cameras and the crowd not discreet or underground at all and yeah he became really popular he basically i think is the most popular person of this era and often when thinking of prohibition or the like old-time gangsters al capone's always like the first one at least with me, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people would share that sentiment too. So, yeah, there's just a lot. I'm sure he's about to unpack right now. One of the biggest bootleggers was a man named George Remus. Oh, never mind. Originally a lawyer, he watched as his bootlegger clients paid off enormous fines like it was nothing and proclaimed bootleggings the business for me. But mm. unlike most bootleggers, Remus had big brain, and he came up with a pretty clever system. See, there were millions of gallons of liquor produced before Prohibition that were sitting in distillery warehouses, and it could only be sold with government permission to drug companies. So Remus set up his own drug company and bought all the liquor. Then he set up his own transport Dang. company to transport the liquor. And then he would send his own men out with guns to intercept his own transport vehicles. And this would happen. Hey man, this is a stick. <laughs> oh no, please don't hurt me. I won't hesitate to shoot. Please, I have a wife and kids. Hand over all the whiskey, fatty. Hey, <laughs> fatty isn't in the script, you jerk. <laughs> After stealing all the whiskey from himself, he could then sell I don't know why he oversimplified jokes are so silly, but they all make me laugh. Like, man, maybe I'm a silly person. For big bucks, the perfect crime. Unfortunately, Remus was eventually caught by a goody two-shoes prohibition director in Indiana who wouldn't take Remus's bribes. And the government found Ooh, Remus- how dare you have integrity. I'm sure. <laughs> For two years, as Remus sat in prison, his wife promised to take care of all of his money. And by take care of his money, she meant have an affair with a prohibition agent, oh. sell off everything Remus owned, and file for divorce. Oh, she was for the streets. I'm so sorry, Remus, even though you're a criminal. <laughs> like, like oh, that, that sucks, dude. When Remus finally got out and found his big fancy mansion empty with his wife gone, he reportedly broke down in tears. A few months later, during their divorce trial, he spotted his wife in a car in Cincinnati. Remus hopped in a cab and asked the driver to run her off the road. The driver was like, okay. Then Wait, Remus what? got out of the cab and shot his wife dead. He immediately handed himself in. Oh, dang. Like, don't get me wrong. What she did was messed up, but. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's wild. I'm sure there's a lot more 
to that story, obviously this is oversimplified. There's way more to a lot of these events. But I wonder what he like why the cab driver agreed to any of that. <laughs> like, sure, I'll do it. Why not? Like, <laughs> Man, I wonder if I can convince Uber drivers to run people off roads. <laughs> the police. And his next trial, this time for murder, became a national sensation. Remus defended himself, claiming insanity, occasionally carrying out skillful questioning, occasionally crying in the corner. But the nation felt bad for him. His wife had screwed him over. Yeah. So when after just 19 minutes of deliberation, the jury returned and declared him not guilty, the court erupted into celebration. And just to wow. remind you, this guy bluntly admitted to murdering his wife. Dude, that sucks. Imagine being guilty. Like, everyone walks in. It's a foregone conclusion, right? Everyone knows you're guilty. Everyone saw it happen. You admitted. And you still get away with... Yeah, okay. Let's all joke. The American justice system is a joke. <laughs> you know, we all have that joke. It's corrupt and not good. But it's the best we got. <laughs> but yeah, it's like stuff like this is insane. Like this dude literally got away with murder because people felt bad his wife cheated on him. <laughs> the American justice system. Mwah. As alcohol yeah. poured into the nation, a lot of it was going to a new type of drinking establishment that had been booming Speakeasies? popularity. A secret drinking establishment. So secret that from the outside, they often look like ordinary shops or homes. So secret that you usually needed a password to get in. So secret that everybody knew about them. Speakeasies. And once you were in, the party went all night long. Scantily clad flappers, snake ladies, jazz. It was a roaring time like to jazz. be alive. Some publications even posted reviews of these illegal clubs. And bribes galore kept the party going. It seemed like half the police officers and federal agents in cities like New York were receiving kickbacks from <laughs> speakeasy owners. Hey, what the Kevin Costner is going on here? <laughs> Officer O'Hannity taking bribes. Why am I not surprised? Prohibition director Simmons? For shame. Mom? <laughs> what would dad say? Ask him yourself. Dad would say, oh my quit gosh. being such a wet blanket and let daddy earn his tips. <laughs> Anytime a speakeasy was wow. shut down by authorities, it seemed like three more would just pop up elsewhere. And some neighborhoods were so full of them that one resident began hanging a sign to try to keep partygoers from constantly knocking on her door. It really seemed like the new laws regarding alcohol, in some places, were simply being ignored. And one prohibition agent who traveled the country liked to see which city was the most defiant by timing how long it took for him to be offered a beer after he arrived. His winner? New Orleans, where a cab driver offered him a drink after just 35 seconds. Hey. Bravo. Many voices in Congress were already speaking out against prohibition yeah. and its failures. Yeah, it to display failed. how ridiculous the whole thing was. It was noble, but it failed. The media to all come and watch him drink a homemade beer. When he asked a passing police officer if he'd like to arrest him, the officer said no. <sighs> hey, Wayne, is all this what you had in mind? I thought we were going to make the country better, but it almost seems like it's worse. Yeah. What do you mean? Alcohol consumption is down. Well, that may be true in your small town, <laughs> but it says here drinking in some areas is up. As are arrests for public intoxication, drunk driving, and incidents of liver cirrhosis. The general chaos has turned America into a nation of criminals with no respect for the law. And all these attempts at enforcement are just costing the economy valuable money and eating up judicial time and resources. Release the lines. <laughs> <laughs> the social change and corruption that Wheeler and the Anti-Saloon League had been so eager to prevent, in the cities at least, was surging. See, when something's legal, you can usually regulate and control it. But make that thing illegal, and often anything becomes fair game. True. Legal drinking age, gone. Mandatory closing hours for clubs and bars, gone. Other unspoken socio-cultural rules surrounding alcohol, gone, gone, gone. Damn. In speakeasies, different yeah, genders and ethnicities were beginning to mingle in a way they hadn't done before. The Roaring Twenties saw a monumental shift in culture. Not least of all, because now men and women could flirt in public without being damned for eternity. An outraged mm. Wayne Wheeler did his best to make sure that anyone breaking the law was punished. He had even stricter legislation put in place in New York. But all this did was clog up the justice system with petty drinking violations. And judges began letting everyone off with light fines so the judges could get back to dealing with things that actually mattered. You know, things like murder. And there was plenty of murder. Yeah. Be the drone age has begun in the large-scale military online action game War Thunder. Because bootleggers and moonshiners were one thing, but prohibition had given another kind of criminal an opportunity to make a fortune. Gangsters. Mobsters. Oh, mobs. And gangsters. Yeah. Hey, Fat Tony. Big news. Hey. hey Fat Joey. What's up? Where's the guy? I just cool. got word from Fat Louie here that the government's outlawing alcohol. You know what that means. That means we're gonna be rich. Quick, 
Cold Fat Pullion, let's go hijack a liquor truck now. All right. Hang on, let me tell my wife first. Hey, Fat Susan! No pizza for Fat Joey tonight, <laughs> capiche? Stop calling me Fat Susan. Ah, ah, come on about it. Ah, ah, come <laughs> <laughs> rival gangs began to battle in America's cities, raiding each other's transports, assassinating rivals, and trying to take control of their city's illicit booze trade. Every city had its top dog. Detroit had the Purple Gang. New England had Charles King Solomon. But no city was as infamous for gang violence and murder as Chicago. The city had multiple gang factions, and at first, they agreed to stay in their own neighborhoods. But the thing about criminals is that their criminals yeah, they break and the rules. agreements inevitably broke down. One day, the leader of the Italian Southside gang was walking along the street when this happened. And he was like, you know, I think I'm done with this, <laughs> and left for New York, leaving his crime empire to his chief enforcer, none other than Al Capone. Having been wow. knifed in the face in his younger years, Capone earned himself the name Scarface. Although interestingly, he hated that nickname and preferred to be called Snorky. I think it could probably be wrong. I remember I looked up the the definition of Snorky or like why he called him so that. I think the term was for like someone who dresses well or who is refined. Again, this is years ago. Like I'm probably probably wrong. I don't probably remember it well, but something like that. But well, come on, dude. Scarface sounds so much cooler. <laughs> Snorky was ruthless, just like any other gang leader in America. But what set him apart from others, the reason he's become synonymous with 1920s gang warfare, is this. Most other gang leaders would try to oh, keep snow. a low- Sorry, I got a call from uh, the fam. They're killing and murdering and stuff. But Capone lived for the fame and kept yeah. an extremely high public profile. There frequently it goes. Frequently speaking with the media about his exploits and presenting himself as a gracious host, providing Chicago with good times. No need to thank me, fellas. I just provide the city with a valuable commodity while doing away with the competition. You mean you murder people? Whoa, <laughs> who said anything about murder? I just, you know, force my rivals I take out the trash. When you do the thing with the hands, it seems like you're talking about murder. Whoa, look <laughs> at you with the brains. No, no, I just help people retire from life to so murder. <laughs> <laughs> Al Snorky Capone was somewhat of an enigma, brutal in how he dealt with enemies, but in front of the camera, he was all smiles. One day, he'd be ordering hit after hit, the next, he'd be signing I keep thinking the- I'm sorry, I keep thinking the, like the Robert De Niro performance. I want him dead! I want his family dead! I want his dog dead! <laughs> uh, oh man, I'm sorry, like, it's just dumb, dumb things, I'm sorry. <laughs> in Wrigley Field. One day, he'd be bludgeoning members of his own gang with a baseball bat for conspiring against him. The next, he'd be playing Santa at a nearby parochial Dang. school. And no murder could ever be traced back to him. Just like every other criminal, he stuffed the pockets of city officials with cold, hard cash. And any who did try to oppose him sometimes found themselves being thrown down the steps of City Hall in broad daylight. Problem solved. The public couldn't get enough of Capone. He quickly became a household name as people romanticized the gang life he lived. And this became a source of concern for the people at the very top. Uh, President Hoover? Ugh, what is it now, Miles? I'm busy. Well, it's just that there's a lot of crime, sir. Crime? How long's that been happening? Well, since the dawn of man, sir. What? Would you like me to blame it on the Democrats again? No, Miles, I want you to blame it on squirrels. <laughs> yes, the Democrats. Now stop wasting my time. Since having a crime lord controlling public officials and winning the hearts of the people probably wasn't a good thing, Hoover personally ordered that something be done about this Capone fellow. But before he knew it, President Hoover was also dealing with another major problem. You know him. You love him. Whoa. Oh, wow. The Prohibition era had been going on for nearly a decade, and anyone with a brain could see that it really wasn't going very well. One person with a brain was Pauline Sabin, an extremely influential and rich woman who served on the Republican National Committee, fundraised for Republican presidents, and had a secret wine room in her giant mansion. Hey. She initially supported Prohibition, but was now disgusted at the chaos it had created, and she began a new women's movement, this time not for Prohibition, but against it. Being the extremely influential woman she was, her new organization gained nearly 1.5 million members within two years, five times that of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. She hated that the WCTU claimed to speak for all women, and she began calling for the repeal of the 18th Amendment. President Hoover, I helped fund your campaign, and now I want you to end prohibition. Miles, what is it I say when I'm not going to do anything? You'll look into <laughs> it, sir. Oh, yeah, that's right. Pauline? I'll look into, look into it, it yes. gave speeches on the steps of Congress and helped start a growing push among the American people against prohibition. But Hoover, a prohibitionist himself, wasn't budging. Then, on the 14th of February, 1929, something happened that shocked the nation. Men, thought to be working for Al Capone, tricked some Irish mobsters into meeting them at a garage in Chicago, thinking they were there to purchase hijacked whiskey. Instead, the mobsters were lined up against the wall by men dressed as police, 
and they were shot. Is this the Valentine's Day massacre? I don't remember. Let's see. The Valentine's yes. Day massacre had people outraged. It was cruel and almost felt like American mobsters had finally crossed a line. People were sick of the violence, and in part, they blamed prohibition for helping to create it. The pressure on Hoover to do something was steadily increasing. Fine. Miles, I want you to put a report together to see if this whole thing is working. You mean, the thing where mobsters are becoming increasingly powerful and massacring each other in the streets and everyone is disregarding the law and half our public officials are corrupt and taking bribes? That thing? Yeah, I want to know if it's working <laughs> oh or not, gosh. Miles. Stop wasting my time! <laughs> Hoover continued to drag his feet on prohibition, but after the Valentine's Day massacre, he was still determined to do one thing. He wanted Al Capone in prison. I want him arrested! Since Capone had been so careful, the FBI were having a hard time charging him. Pig? Him, but eventually, <laughs> they got him. Capone, we know you're supplying Chicago with alcohol and you've been involved in yeah, countless murders. Yeah, I, I think the, funny, the, the funniest thing about Al Capone is that it was tax evasion that I think that finally got him. Not the murders or any of the big, big crimes, you know? Whoa, look at you with the crazy talk. I ain't done none of that stuff. But you're rich, right? You're damn right I am. And so where'd all the money come from, Capone? All right, I'll let you in on a little secret, but you gotta promise not to tell anyone, okay? I don't pay my taxes. <laughs> Whoa! Role of his murder, the IRS Whoa! finally got Capone on tax evasion. At his trial, he didn't seem too concerned though, and spent most of his time having a laugh with his lawyers. Hey Capone, I gotta know, why are you so confident you're gonna win here? Well, Your Honor, because I'm an honest man with a big heart who's passionate about working for the good of the people. And also because I threatened the entire jury's families. Luckily, mm. at the last minute, the judge replaced the entire jury pool with a new one that Capone's men hadn't yet got to, and Capone was found guilty. He was sentenced to 11 years in federal prison, the harshest penalty ever given to a tax evader. Dang. But even with Capone locked away, the violence in Chicago and other cities continued. And in response, the movement against prohibition continued to grow. And the final nail in prohibition's coffin came in 1929. After a decade of booming economic growth under three Republican presidents, the stock market plummeted, and America was thrown into the grips of the Great Depression. It yeah. was an awful time. One out of every five workers, 15 million people, would lose their jobs. Half the nation's banks failed. Temporary shanty towns were built for the broken homeless in public parks. Suddenly, very few people had time to care about prohibition. Expensive enforcement of an unenforceable law didn't seem like that big of a priority when people were having their homes repossessed and losing their life savings. And many began to argue that repealing prohibition would create vital jobs and tax revenue for the government. Yet President Hoover doubled down. Here's that report you asked for, sir. Give me. Prohibition is great. Fantastic news. <laughs> uh, sir, it says here prohibition is great at undermining the rule of law in America. Miles, it says the word great. That means good. Now stop wasting my time! <laughs> the public, increasingly shocked stop at the violence on the streets, the corruption they saw in the government, the general disregard for the law, and now an economic calamity had had enough. For his re-election, Hoover faced a Democratic candidate who promised to finally do something about prohibition, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Crowds cheered as FDR made his campaign speeches promising to modify the Volstead Act, and Pauline Sabin, a lifelong Republican, along with her 1.5 million supporters, endorsed Roosevelt. And on election day, it was a landslide. Before FDR had even taken office, Republicans in Congress began the process of passing the 21st Amendment to repeal prohibition. One of FDR's first acts as president was to pass the Beer Permit Act, which made beer legal while the new amendment was being ratified. In 1933, with the passage of the 21st Amendment, prohibition was finally over and the people celebrated like they'd just won a world war. Bars and taverns were packed. The WCTU were inconsolable. Wayne Wheeler was dead. And the celebration, oh, wow. particularly in America's cities, was intense. Heading into the mid-1930s, the effects of prohibition were clear to see. From now on, culture around drinking had changed, with men and women drinking together, not in saloons, but in bars and taverns. The crime syndicates that had been given so much power through prohibition remained powerful as they moved on to other things. Yeah, drugs. Some states opted to remain dry, with Oklahoma only repealing its prohibition laws in 1959. To this day, there are still counties in America with some form of prohibition. So what did we learn today, kids? What's the big lesson here? What's the moral of this story that we can all take away and apply to our day-to-day -day lives? Maybe that you shouldn't force your own morals on others who don't share them? Yeah. Maybe that if you tell Americans not to do something, that's the one thing they'll definitely do. This is humans maybe in general. No maybe we're all just a bunch of dumb, stinky idiots, and we're all doomed. True. The end. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, guys. So that was Oversimplified's video on prohibition. I hope you enjoyed it. I love learning a lot about this and refreshing my mind in regards to prohibition and just overall entertaining. And I'll see you all in the next Oversimplified video. Bye, everyone.